Welcome, everybody, to the uh, English session from tonight's Hartman Conference for a Democratic and Jewish Israel. My name is Alan Abbey, and I will introduce our speakers in a minute. I would just like you to know that uh, this program is being filmed at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, and we're going to have a speaker from our New York uh, office with us in a few minutes, uh, Ilana, Dr. Ilana Steinhain, and she's going to be our first speaker tonight. And before we get even one step further, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to give you a very small commercial, because not only uh, are we doing this live webinar program tonight, but in about a week, uh, eight days actually, the night of the Israeli elections, March 17th, we're going to be doing another live program here at the Institute. This program is going to be actually live ending of the, uh, when the polls close in, in Israel. And we're going to be going on the air at 9.30 Israel, which is 3.30 in, 3.30 p.m. in the east and uh, back to 12.30 p.m. in California. And we'll be on the air from 3.30 uh, till 4.30 Eastern Time or 9.30 to 10.30 here in Israel. And at 10 o'clock when the polls close and uh, the exit polls are announced by the Israeli television stations, we will break into our conversation, give you a live update, and then we'll have continued conversation about the results of the elections. And we expect this to uh, be something of significant interest. And it will be on the Hartman website. It will be in several other places as well. Turn in, tune in to us in coming days for more details on that program. But now I want to bring uh, to you to today's, to today's program. The uh, title of the session is Zionism, Minorities, and Loyalties, and our speakers today are Dr. Ilana Steinhain and Madi Friedman, and I'm very excited for two reasons. First of all, they're two excellent speakers, and second of all, uh, Ilana is fairly new to uh, Hartman, and this is, by the way, Mati Friedman's first uh, appearance on behalf of the Hartman Institute. He has joined us as a research fellow with our I Engage project, and we're very, very excited to have him. So I'm going to just take a second to introduce them a little bit briefly, and and then we'll go right to their presentations. So Dr. Ilana Steinhain is the Director of Leadership Education for the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, based in our New York office. And she is a dynamic and exciting speaker and a significant scholar, and I think you'll be really entranced by her presentation. Um, I suspect many of the people in this room here in Jerusalem, at least, and many, many uh, watching us online uh, also know Mati Friedman, uh, the journalist and author, prize-winning author, who has, uh, as I said, just recently joined the Hartman Institute. And so... These are two excellent speakers. I think you'll get two very interesting and, and differing presentations. After their talks, time permitting, and we certainly plan on that, there will be time for questions, both from the live audience here in Jerusalem and online. If you're watching this online, you should see on the right-hand side of the web page a, a module that allows you to uh, chat, and we in, encourage chatting during class, as it were, sending notes during class, uh, posting tweets, and we will ask uh, some questions, uh, both from our live and our online audiences. So now, without any further ado, I'd like to bring you from our New York office with the beautiful skyline of New York City behind her, Dr. Ilana Steinhain. Ilana, it's all yours. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alan. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, I have to say I am very excited to be here and to be here, as it were, and to be in people's, probably people's offices and living rooms and wherever people are watching this. Um, it's a bit of an out-of-body experience, I have to say, because you're all looking at a person and I'm looking directly at a camera. So we're going to do the best that we can to imagine this camera as a room full of people. Um, I also want to say what a pleasure it is to speak with Mati. Aside from following his work, I'm so happy to call him a colleague at this point, and I hope that our respective presentations really dovetail nicely and complement and supplement one another. So without further ado, I'm actually just going to jump in. What I want to talk about um, tonight, today, is actually the question of loyalties and minorities. And when we think about the identity of Israel's minority population, or its 20 percent uh, large minority population of what some call Arab Israelis, what other called Palestinians in Israel or Palestinian Arabs, I'm, I'm confronted by uh, a little bit of a 
a paucity of language. Living as an American Jew and an American Zionist, I'm really animated by a statement about dual loyalties that runs very simply according to the line set by Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis back in 1915. If everyone would just skip with me to number six on your source sheet, what's wonderful about this source is you're looking at an American Jew, uh, you know, born in Kentucky, early 20th century, who has very high aspirations and is actually the year after he gives this speech or the excerpt from this speech, the following year he's nominated to the United States Supreme Court. He essentially finds himself trying to um, trying to defend dual loyalties. He tries, he tries to defend his loyalty to Zionism and his loyalty to the United States as things that don't have to conflict and don't have to contradict. And the excerpt is as follows. He's making this plea, essentially, to the Conference of the Eastern Council of Reform Rabbis, trying to convince them that the accusation of dual loyalties that followed the Jewish people throughout history, starting in the very first century of the Common Era with Apian, for those who might be familiar um, with that Hellenistic piece of hi history of Jews as misanthropic and only caring about their own and not caring about anyone else, or all the way to the story of Napoleon's Sanhedrin, as it was called, that, that when he decided that he was going to give rights to the Jews of France, specifically the Jews of Europe, wherever he conquered, he had to convene a bunch of rabbis to essentially have them ask questions about their loyalty to France, whether they could be completely loyal to France, but they have loyalty to Judaism. So this question, the bugaboo of dual loyalty, followed the Jewish people around like uh, it was an anti-Semitic trope for a very long time. And, and what Brandeis does in this speech is he tries to actually advance the cause and advocate for dual loyalty as something that is completely permissible and okay, and something that actually is incumbent upon American Jews. So if you look with me, he says, let no American imagine that Zionism is inconsistent with patriotism. Multiple loyalties are objectionable only if they are inconsistent. A man is a better citizen of the United States for also being a loyal citizen of his state, of his city, or for being loyal to his college. Every American Jew who aids in advancing the Jewish settlements in Palestine, though he feels that neither he nor his descendants will ever live there, will likewise be a better man and a better American for doing so. There is no inconsistency between loyalty to America and loyalty to Jewry. As an American Jew, the dual loyalty that I have, and I know that for some people it feels dangerous to say dual loyalty, the dual loyalty that I have to the state of Israel and to the United States, they run on parallel tracks. Seldom do they contradict one another, seldom do they conflict. It's very com comfortable to have both of these loyalties at once. And quite frankly, what's been happening, what you've seen in the North American Jewish community in sort of the month leading up to Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech in Congress, and now the aftermath, is you see American Jews grappling with this question of whether there is something to be worried about, a tension uh, between those two, because quite frankly, it never appears as a tension in at least my mind and most of the minds of the American Jewish Zionists who I know. When it comes to the question of Arab Israelis or the questions of Palestinians in Israel, this is a different question altogether. The idea that these two identities can run on parallel tracks without ever conflicting is somewhat oxymoronic. So what I want to do in the following, I suppose, 15, 20 minutes that we have together, is I want to look at two models from the Jewish tradition, two, two models from the Jewish tradition in which Jews are essentially accused of being a fifth column. I want to look at what the accusations were. I want to look at how the accusations relate to questions of particularism, disloyalty, even sedition. And I want to use this as somewhat of a continuum for talking about how Arab Israelis or Palestinians in Israel view themselves and how the Jewish majority can start thinking perhaps in a different paradigm than what Brandeis sets up, in a different paradigm for how this can work, how this relationship can work how the state incorporating different elements with different identities can actually function. The first model, 
as we find ourselves between Purim and Pesach. The first model is actually from Megillat Esther, from the Scroll of Esther. The second model is actually going to be from the Passover story. It's going to be from the beginning of the book of Exodus. In the first model, we're looking at a Jewish people that has been displaced, it's in this huge empire, this huge sprawling empire. And the unfortunate circumstance happens to be that there is someone who is second to the king named Haman, who would like everyone to bow to him. That is something that has been endorsed by the king himself, King Ahasuerus. But unfortunately, right outside the palace, Mordechai the Jew refuses to bow. And that's where we enter the story. I'm looking with you at source number two. I'm going to read it in English. Sometime afterward, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamdata the Agagite. He advanced him and seated him higher than any other fellow officials. All the king's courtiers in the palace gate knelt and bowed to Haman, for such was the king's order concerning him. But Mordechai would not kneel or bow. Then the king's, the king's courtiers who were in the palace gate said to Mordechai, why do you disobey the king's order? When they spoke to him day after day and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordechai's resolve would prevail. For he had explained to them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordechai would not kneel or bow to him, Haman was filled with rage, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordechai alone, having been told who Mordechai's people were. Haman then plotted to do away with the Jews, Mordechai's people, all the Jews throughout the kingdom of Ahasuerus. Let's stop here for a moment and ask ourselves the question, why is it that Mordechai refused to bow? Why would he not bow to Haman? It seems, according to the other servants of the court, there was something seditious about this practice. Why are you disobeying the king's orders? Unfortunately, Mordechai doesn't feel, see fit to explain why he's disobeying the king's orders. Jewish tradition would fill it in that he actually is disobeying the king's orders out of religious particularism, out of religious conviction and resolve not to bow to a human being as Jews bow only to God. But the continuum between his religious particularism and what appears to be seditious, treacherous, disloyal, What's happening is we're seeing an overlap and an overlay. For Haman, it's not, not clear whether Haman cares at all about the nationalistic peace, whether he cares at all what the servants seem to care about, which is you're not listening to the king. He seems to simply be angry, a personal vendetta, personal feelings. This man is not bowing to me, and I'm going to make everyone pay. But what happens next is a sound dancing, because Haman can take his own personal experience bring it to Ahasuerus, the king, and get a fair hearing. In the first month, verse 7, we continue. That is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, which means the lot, was cast before Haman concerning every day and every month, until it fell on the 12th month, that is the month of Adar. Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the other peoples, in all the provinces of your realm, whose laws are different from those of any other people and who do not obey the king's laws. And this is not in your majesty's interest, your majesty's interest, excuse me, to tolerate them. If it please your majesty, let an edict be drawn for their destruction, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, Ahasuerus takes off his ring and says, do what you need to do. What's fascinating about this passage is that it is clear that Haman's motivation and Ahasuerus' motivation is very different. Haman uses all the classic moves of othering a group. He doesn't call them by their names. He refers to them all as one unit. There is one group of people. He plays off of Ahasuerus' political fears. They do not keep your laws. It's not about religious particularism. It's not about the particularism of Mordechai's identity. This is a fifth column, a group of people who simply does not obey the king's orders. They are a state within a state. And Ahasuerus, not knowing anything of the personal vendetta that Haman has, immediately says, well, of course, a state within a state. 
that can't be permitted. What's incredible about this passage is that the way that we Jews interpret it is this was about particularism. This was about religious conviction. The way it was interpreted and so easily interpreted, this was about sedition. This was about rebellion. This was about treachery. And quite frankly, that's a stretch for us. For the other side, it wasn't such a stretch. There's another piece of the puzzle, which is the way that Haman gets to the Jews is he says, there's this group that is fundamentally other and disloyal. If we look at the Greek translation, the official Greek translation, the Septuagint of Migilat Esther, we find something further, what can I say? I think expected in a way. If the currency of the day is to other another group in order to get them on the outs with the king, well then Mordechai and Esther, the heroes of the Purim story, when they're trying to assert the Jewish right to self-defense, they use that very same currency. Let's take a look at number three, the right side, the right-hand column, the Septuagint, the version in the Septuagint that describes permitting self-defense. This is the letter that Achashverosh sends out to 127 provinces saying, we permit the Jews to defend themselves. In that letter, there must be some explanation for why it is that Haman's original letter should not be heeded. For Haman, a Macedonian, the son of Adamathes, actually alien to the Persian, to Persian blood, and far removed from our practice of beneficence or the hospitality received by us. He had obtained so large a share of the generous favor we extend toward all peoples as to be called our father and received continual reverence from all as the person next to the royal throne. But he, not having borne properly the dignity of his great station, tried to deprive us of our kingdom and of our life, having by varied and guileful devices sought the destruction both of Mordechai, our rescuer and benefactor throughout, and of blameless Esther, sharer of our kingdom, together with all their nation. For by these tactics, he planned having us in a helpless state to transfer the dominion of Persia to the Macedonians. How is it that the Jews are able to assert their right to self-defense? Well, Haman is really the outsider. Haman is really the traitor. The currency of the day was to point out who might be on the outs with society, with the mainstream. Who might indicate a measure of disloyalty all the way way to sedition. And this is a wild story because on both sides, ultimately, there are very personal forces at play, but the way it gets described and the way it gets, gets depicted and the way it gets deployed is in a manner that discusses being a traitor, being disloyal. Now, I have to say, if things were that simple, if things were that simple, that the identity of someone living in Israel as a minority could simply be a matter of, no, this is particularism. This is particularism, and you're interpreting it as something that is disloyal or a fifth column, but this is merely particularism. I wish that was always the case. I have to say, though, that it's important to consider that as being the case for people who do identify themselves primarily as Palestinians living in Israel and still are very comfortable as Israeli citizens. To think about whether sometimes the particularism gets defined as sedition by definition, even without seeing any actions that indicate that. I hope that people's wheels are turning in their minds. I'd imagine that they are. Trying to learn in my um, new Hartman experience, I'm trying to learn how to get under the skin a little bit so that we can get people to react and respond and think. And I like that Alan is smiling about that. I want to, I want to give you the second example. The second example, the second model, is actually, I think, much easier to swallow. Because the second model is the model of Exodus, where, to be honest, 
What the group is accused of, it's really not clear whether what the group is being accused of is simply particularism. I don't think it is, quite frankly. Let's take a look together. And this I'm going to read Exodus 1 in the Hebrew and translate. Vayamat Yosef Joseph dies, and so do his brothers, and so does the whole generation. And the Israelites multiply. And a new king arises over Egypt who does not know Joseph, doesn't know Joseph, doesn't want to know Joseph. Hard to believe that he wouldn't know who Joseph was, given that Joseph was the viceroy just with the previous paro and saved Egypt from a major famine. Vayomer Elamo, and he said to his nation, Hine am b'nei Yisrael rav v'atsum mimenu. The nation of the children of Israel is greater than we are. And notice the use of am, the nation, collective, all of them together. Hava nitchakmalo, the use of singular. Let us deal wisely with him, the entire nation, as one unity. Pen yirbe and let us deal wisely with him, lest he multiply, continue in the singular, lest it multiply, and lest it gather together with, and here the plural comes back, our enemies. We have more than one enemy. Our enemies, lest he gather with our enemies, excuse me, and fight against us. And we know the continuation of the story. The continuation of the story is slavery. When I read this, always growing up, I didn't understand what is the connection? What is the connection between Joseph's death and Pharaoh suddenly looking to the Jews and saying, well, the Israelites, there are too many of them. We need to do something about this. But I have to say that a pseudepigraphal work that is a work that is not included in the Hebrew Bible. It's not included in the Christian canon either. A work that is written sometime within the Second Temple period and purports to be a retelling of the book of Genesis and a little bit of the book of Exodus. The book of Jubilees tries to fill in the blanks. And the way it tries to fill in the blanks is it says you have to understand realpolitik. You have to understand realpolitik. When Joseph died, Egypt was at war with Canaan. Egypt was at war with Canaan. And for that reason, the gates of Egypt were closed. For that reason, none of the Israelites were able to bury their dead in Canaan. And let's see what happens next. Go with me to number five, please, if you were in the book of Jubilees. And it came to pass that after Jacob died, the children of Israel multiplied in the land of Egypt, and they became a great nation, and they were of one accord in heart. And there was no Satan nor any evil all the days of the life of Joseph, which he lived after his father Jacob. For all the Egyptians honored the children of Israel all the days of the life of Joseph. And Joseph died being 110 years old. And he died, and all his brethren, and all the generation. And he commanded the children of Israel before he died that they should carry his bones with them when they went forth from the land of Egypt. And he made them swear regarding his bones, for he knew that the Egyptians would not again bring forth and bury him in the land of Canaan. Why? Because they were at war with the Canaanites. For Macamaron, king of Canaan, while dwelling in the land of Assyria, fought in the valley with the king of Egypt and slew him there and pursued after the Egyptians to the gates of Ermon. The Egyptians, their pharaoh is slaughtered by a Canaanite king outside of Egypt. They close the gates of Egypt, keeping the Canaanites at bay. But he, that is the king of Canaan, Macamaron, was not able to enter, for another new king had become king of Egypt. This is the king who doesn't know Joseph. And he was stronger. And Macamaron, the Canaanite king, returned to the land of Canaan, and the gates of Egypt were closed, and none went out, and none came in. But there's a moment at which the gates of Egypt open once again, and they open for the purpose of warring against Canaan, against Canaan. Verse 9, and the king of Egypt went forth to war with the king of Canaan. 
And at that moment, when those gates open for the purpose of making war on Canaan, Joseph's family decides now is the time to go to Canaan and bury our dead. And the children of Israel brought forth all the bones of the children of Jacob, except for the bones of Joseph, and they buried them in the field of the double cave in the mountain in Canaan. And most of them returned to Egypt, but a few of them remained in the mountains of Hebron. I want to skip with you for lack of time. I want to skip with you to verse 12. In verse 12, the king of Egypt does what we see in our biblical text. And he devised, that is, the king of Egypt devised an evil device against the children of Israel of afflicting them. And he said to the people of Egypt, behold, the people of the children of Israel have increased and multiplied more than we. Come and let us deal wisely with them before they become too many. And let us afflict them with slavery before war come upon us, before they too fight against us. Else they will join themselves unto our enemies and get them up out of our land. For their hearts and their faces are towards the land of Canaan. The accusation of the Israelites as a fifth column. What happened here? Egypt is at war with Canaan, and it's at that moment that the Israelites decide, you know where we need to bury our dead in Canaan. And they stay there, and they live there. Is that mere particularism? Doesn't seem so clear that that's mere particularism. What kind of dual loyalty is that? Certainly the way that the Egyptian pharaoh interprets it here is he interprets it here as an act of sedition. I believe that my time is almost up. What I want to leave you with is I want to leave you with, number one, the difficulty in simply asserting that the particularism of my, a minority is the equivalent of sedition. Number two, to recognize that there are members of minority populations who do engage in acts that favor a Palestinian Israeli identity, or I should say a Palestinian identity over an Israeli identity to the degree that it tries to undermine the state. Each of those exist, but I also wanna say that there's something in the middle that Louis Brandeis could not have envisioned. There's something in the middle and it's that space in the middle where someone feels a fundamental, has a fundamental argument or a fundamental discomfort with the state or the way that it came into being. But that doesn't lead the person to disengage from the duties of being a citizen. And it doesn't lead a person to seditious practices. But it's not as simple as just being, well, this is my particularism and it doesn't impact at all the way that I think about you. It's that space in between that I think we need to think, I think we need to try to navigate. It's that space in between that is the crux of the conversation that must be had. Because those who are on the extreme on either side, they're not necessarily the issue that we are going to resolve by conversation and discourse. Actions must be taken appreciation must be had, but it's that space in between the particularism and the rebellion, so to speak, that needs to be navigated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilana. Uh, you'll stick with us, of course, to listen to Mati, and then uh, we'll have some questions from both, as I said, the online and the uh, live audience here. Mati Friedman, your turn. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? <coughs> Much now can everyone hear me? Yeah. Should I do it like that? Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much, Ilana. And although Alan suggested you stick around, you really don't have to. Um, the city behind you beckons. Um, and if I were you, I might go for a walk in Manhattan. Um, when we talk about minorities in Israel, <clears throat> we often um, end up uh, arriving at a, some version of the following sentence, which is that once we were a minority and now we're a majority, and we are mistreating a minority just as we were once mistreated. Um, that is not untrue, of course. Um, I also think that it leads us to the correct um, um, moral conclusions 
I would like our behavior here in Israel to be based on that, um, on that understanding and not on another understanding. However, it is not uh, particularly helpful in understanding the complexities of Israel's actual situation on planet Earth. Um, and that is being increasingly made clear now, um, as anyone watching the Middle East, um, I, I think, understands. The, the, the complexities of, of Israel's real situation were brought home to me recently when I met a really interesting guy um, named Shadi Khalul, who's from a town in northern Israel called Jish. Shadi's a Christian, a Maronite Christian. The Maronites, as uh, some or most of you probably know, uh, are members of a very old church, a Middle Eastern church that is affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, he was born and raised in Jish. He's uh, a native Arabic speaker. Um, and he is an interesting lens through which to view the Christians of Israel. The Christians of Israel are a, a minority inside a minority. Um, the Arab population here is roughly 1.5 million, and about 10% of Israel's Arabs are Christian. So we're talking about a very small minority inside the one-fifth uh, Arab minority. Being a minority always means maneuvering amid the majority, and it necessarily involves contortions as um, North American Jews are aware um, or should be. Um, and these contortions are on display all the time whenever you look at any minority. For example, Bibi's recent speech in, con in, in Congress, you could see um, the contortions that it required from many in the North American um, Jewish community. He doesn't speak for me. He does speak for me. I am like him. I'm not like him. I'm more like you than him. Um, this is standard uh, minority behavior. Um, if we look at the Christians here, um, Christians who are in the historically unprecedented situation of being a minority among Jews, uh, which is not a simple uh, theological uh, position for, for many Christians, if we look at their situation, we can learn something about what it means to be a minority, particularly in this part of the world. And understanding what it means to be a minority in this part of the world is uh, crucial right now because the fate of minorities in the Middle East is perhaps the most important story at play in this region over the past century, and we're very much part of it. Uh, Israel's story in the 21st century is going to have a lot more to do with the Yazidis than it has to do with the Warsaw Ghetto. And people trying to understand this country and its place right now need to be thinking a lot about the Middle East and less about Europe. Before I continue, I'll just as a parenthetical caveat. Um, note that the Christian world in Israel is actually much more complicated than I'm going to describe. The, the native Arab Christian minority um, is only part of the Christian world here. And in fact, they're outnumbered by other components of the Christian world here, um, Filipinos, uh, South Americans. Um, uh, a Catholic priest told me not long ago that if you went by the number of Catholics in Israel, each major Israeli city should have a cathedral according to the standards of the Catholic Church. Um, a significant portion of the uh, Soviet um, immigrants to Israel are uh, Russian Orthodox, some of them practicing. And if you take all the people in Israel who are not registered as either Jews or Muslims, they outnumber the native Arab Christians uh, five to one. So the Christian world is much more complicated than, <laughs> than what we're going to talk about, which is the native Arab Christian minority. In the Ottoman world, the Christians were a religious minority um, with certain communal arrangements, like many other religious minorities, including the Jews, of course. With the rise of Arab nationalism in the 20th century, this starts to change. And many Christians become prominent in Arab nationalist movements. Because if Arab identity was about language and culture more than it was about religion, then they could join the majority. And it might remind us of the Jewish embrace of communism, for example, as a way, as a ticket um, into the majority culture, an idea that would kind of make those divisions, uh, the classic divisions, less important and provide another way in. So Christians become important in the Arab nationalist movement. The, the founder of the Ba'ath party, Michel Aflac, is a Christian. Um, um, one of the godfathers of terrorism, uh, PFLP leader George Habash is Christian. Um, the Christians of Palestine share the disaster of 1948 and have traditionally seen themselves as part of the Palestinian story. That is, they've seen themselves in opposition to Israel. Um, so while some small sects in Israel uh, have bound themselves to the state, particularly the Druze, the Christians never did. 
and they aren't subject to the draft, for example, that being the key indicator of, of allegiance in this country, um, they would see serving in the military as a betrayal of their people, of the Palestinian people. And this remains the majority position, and it is strongly held. But things might be changing. And Shadi Halun, who I just mentioned, it, uh, is part of it. And it's hard to tell how significant the change is exactly, but it's definitely worth, worth tracking. The Christians have been watching, as everyone here has, uh, the unraveling of the region and the rise of radical Islam over the past 20 years, first here in the form of Hamas, uh, of course in Lebanon in the form of Hezbollah, which is a development that has eclipsed the traditional um, elite in Lebanon which was Christian, Maronite Christian. Um, the Christians here saw, as we all saw, what happened to the, excuse me, what happened to the, Chal the Chaldeans in northern Iraq and the other Christians uh, of Iraq, and they saw those 21 Copts uh, led along the beach the other day uh, to be beheaded by the guys from the Islamic State. Um, there are immense and horrific changes afoot here, and everything going on in this region has to do with those changes. Um, not everyone in the West has caught up. Many observers have not caught up, but everything going on here here in Israel and in the general vicinity has to do with that. Everyone is responding to that. So there are a few cracks showing in the traditional allegiance of the local Christian population. And there are signs that the old minority instincts, which should be f familiar to us, are kicking in in kind of interesting ways, the instinct mainly being to bind yourself to a power that can protect you. Um, that um, should be familiar to Jews. So Shadi is part of a forum that is trying to get Christian Arab kids to join the army when they finish high school. Uh, he himself was an officer in the, in the paratroops, Sanchanim, and he um, has kind of shifted his um, self-definition. He does not want to see himself uh, primarily as Arab. He's involved in attempts to revive uh, Aramaic, as a language spoken in Jish. There's a center in Jish teaching Aramaic. Aramaic, of course, would strike Jews as uh, not a threatening language. It's a familiar language to us. To us, in, in many ways, it's a Jewish language, the Talmud, etc. cetera. Um, Shadi and there are others like him don't want to be part of the Muslim majority in the Middle East. They think they need to be protected from the Muslim majority in the Middle East. That he looks around for potential allies, and of course, he finds Israel. Um, which, although it has neglected its Arab minorities in many ways since the state was founded, is also generally happy to find al allies inside those, those minorities and is um, kind of happy to have Shadi on board. He's found willing partners, ironically or not, uh, primarily on the Israeli right. When he uh, began circulating a document expressing his community's uh, particular concerns, um, he didn't get anywhere with the left. The parties of the left um, hope to get um, Muslim votes. The Labour Party has uh, an apparatus uh, among the, the Israeli Arab mainstream, and what Shadi has to offer is not very many votes and something that could complicate their position in the broader uh, Arab scene. He got nowhere with the left and ended up on the list, the party list, in the current election of Israel Beitenu, which is kind of a, an ultra-nationalist party headed by Avigdor Lieberman, I think Shadi's number 11, uh, something like that, which does not look uh, good for him according to the polling numbers. Um, and he's currently running around northern Israel speaking in people's living rooms in Christian towns and trying to drum up support for Israel Beitenu. And he swore when we spoke that when we look at the election breakdown after the results are published, the number of Christian Arab voters for Israel Beitenu is going to surprise everyone. Yeah, so we'll see if that actually pans out. But, uh, but that's what he said. And we might remember an earlier attempt in this century on the part of Christians in Lebanon, also Maronites, to present themselves as Phoenicians. Anyone familiar with that episode? It's a fascinating historical episode. You can read about it. Many Maronites in Lebanon decided that they were not Arabs. They were actually Phoenicians. Um, and there was a kind of a renaissance of Phoenician uh, culture. And this was seen as a more acceptable way to present yourself vis-a-vis -vis Europe. 
one did not want to be Middle Eastern, one wanted to be something else, um, so they would be Phoenician. And this was undertaken with a, a great energy for a period of time. It has kind of faded, although I happened to visit Lebanon about 10 years ago and met someone who told me that he was Phoenician. Um, so it hasn't died out completely. And of course, we might remember Jews calling themselves um, Frenchmen of the Mosaic persuasion or Germans of the Mosaic persuasion, it being acknowledged that being a Jew was nothing you wanted to be, so you should find some other way of describing yourself. And again, this is a classic minority behavior. The spiritual leader of this new movement, if that's what we can call it, that might be overdoing it, but if that's what we can call it um, among Arabs here, is a Greek Orthodox priest named Gabriel Nadef, uh, we can also read about. Um, he's from Nazareth. Pretty young guy, he's 40 or so. Um, Nazareth, which of course is the birthplace of Jesus, um, has um, had a Muslim majority for for quite some time. It, it's been a while since Nazareth was a Christian majority town. And some Christians there feel that their position is, is eroding. Uh, Shadi mentioned um, as a particular affront, uh, a banner that was erected by the Islamic movement in Nazareth outside the Church of the Annunciation a few years ago, which uh, was a Quranic quote engaging in, pol in a kind of polemic with Christianity, saying that anyone who does not accept Islam um, will not be redeemed and will be among the the losers, his, history's losers, and several uh, similar signs have appeared around um, around there. So what they feel, which is what a lot of people in the Middle East feel, is that what they're dealing with is a kind of aggressive, uh, very assertive strain of, of Islam that endangers them. A friend of mine who's the military correspondent for the Times of Israel, Mitch Ginsburg, uh, whose stories are uh, very much worth reading. Um, he uh, interviewed Nadaf not long ago and had a very interesting conversation with him. Nadaf, uh, is kind of on to the Jewish thing in a very interesting way. So he, first of all, told Mitch that he thinks that the Christian Arabs of Israel are kind of like Jews in that they uh, do well in school. Obviously, he has not been um, actually paying attention to Israeli schools, but that's okay. I'm happy uh, for anyone to have that misconception. Um, um, you know, they get good jobs. They don't you know, make uh, too many uh, problems crime-wise. Um, if you look at the matriculation breakdown here every year, there's a few Christian schools that are always in the top tier. Um, so that's an accurate observation. He feels very strongly that Jesus was a Jew. He believes that Israel is the land of the Jews. Um, and he believes that while Christians and Muslims live alongside each other and obviously always have, Christians have a covenant with Jews that they do not have with Muslims. Um, his car tires have been slashed. His son uh, was beat up last year. He gets death threats over the phone fairly often, and he's not allowed to walk around Nazareth uh, by himself anymore. Um, that's the extent of the uh, of the danger Nadaf is in as a result of his of his position. Um, and let's just discuss uh, briefly the the. Uh, the, the counter uh, position, the, the opposing position, um, the probably the kind of most um, prominent proponent of the kind of a, a, a attack on these guys um, is Hanin Zuabi, who is a fiery kind of um, Arab nationalist lawmaker from a party called Balad. Um, she, um, Balad, by the way, as another example of kind of a minority um, maneuver, Balad, the longtime leader of Balad, was uh, an MK named Azmi Bshara, who was also a fiery and outspoken, and I would say very well-spoken, uh, critic of Israel and Zionism, also a Christian. Um, he, as you might remember, got into trouble after the Lebanon war in 2006 for contacts with Hezbollah. Um, and fled the country rather than face trial and currently lives in Qatar. He's um, the former leader of Balad, which is Hanin Zabi's party. Um, he, here's what uh, Zobi, who is kind of a disciple of Bashara, had to say to Nadaf in an open letter, which Mitch quotes in his article. What you are doing, she says to him, she's also from Nazareth, by the way, so he's a Christian from Nazareth, she's a Muslim. What, are you, what you are doing is endangering the Christian youth when you separate him from his people and change him into an enemy of his people and assist his true enemies. That's us. The Arab Christians are not a neutral bridge. They are part of the weave of our Arab Palestinian people. Our Palestinian people are the ones under attack, and what harms one sect harms us all. So she's basically saying, you're part of us. Don't, don't cross the line. When Shadi and, um, and uh, Father Nadaf hear that kind of thing, they hear uh, a Muslim voice telling them, don't you dare cross us. So people hear different things. A Christian Arab woman from a village called Rame, which is also in the north, after this whole thing broke, she set up a Facebook page called Fire Nadaf from the Greek Orthodox Church. And when Mitch interviewed him, she said, um, we live, this is how she explained her position, we live within a conflict, 
as a second-rate minority within a nation that is occupying our nation. I can understand integrating into Israeli society, but not through the army. And to do so, she added, would constitute very dangerous steps that would sow hatred between neighbors. This reminded me of an ad that I once found, which was placed by a Jewish youth group in Damascus, Syria, in 1929, a time of rising ferment around the rise of Zionism and the rise of Arab nationalism. This is what the ad said. Zionism was founded by the Jews in Northern Europe, and the Jews of Damascus are totally estranged from it. It is for this reason that we have come to declare by the present note to our Arab fellow citizens and to the members of the press our attitude vis-a-vis -vis the Zionist question, and we ask them to differentiate between the European Zionists and the Jews who have been living for centuries in these lands. Okay? So that you might be hearing all kinds of things about those guys. Those guys are not us. We're like you. We're not like them. And here, too, you see a, a, min a minority maneuvering in a very precarious position. The people who the woman from Rame sees as her neighbors are Muslim Arabs. This is the majority that she sees as her point of reference. Um, Shadi Khalil and, and Gabriel Nadaf, on the other hand, have decided that, in fact, the neighbors who they care about, the majority that is their point of reference, is the Jews. This is the, this is the majority um, that they think will, will help them, in part because this majority is, crucially, itself a minority. Because, of course, the question of who is a minority is not as simple as it, as it is often presented. Um, just to give you an example, when we cover the story in Ferguson, Missouri, we could cover that story uh, depending on how you draw the geographical boundaries of what you're talking about. We could cover that story as an African-American majority and a white minority. Ferguson's two-third African-American, unless I'm, uh, you know, I might be a bit off, but that's more, more or less what it is. Um, of, so we could cover it as an African-American majority and a white minority. Of course, that would involve losing all of the history and context that make that situation comprehensible. Um, if we look inside Israel and at the territories controlled by Israel, which together constitute 0.2% of the Arab world, um, Jews are a, are a majority. If we zoom out and look at the Arab world, Jews in Israel are outnumbered 60 to 1 by uh, the population of the Arab world, and if we zoom out further and look at the Islamic world, the Jews in Israel are outnumbered 200 to 1. Um, so Israel's minority, mainly Muslim Arabs, are part of the majority population of this region. And it's a majority which, as we're currently seeing, um, has turned on its minorities. So the Muslims under Israeli rule see themselves as a minority, and of course that's true. They are, they are a minority, but regionally they're a majority. So one of the main problems that kind of traditional Islamic uh, view has with the existence of uh, Muslims under Jewish control is not just the fact that minority life is always uncomfortable for anyone and unfortunate for anyone who finds himself or herself in that, in that particular situation, but that this is an unnatural state of affairs. Um, it is an unjust state of affairs because Muslims are not meant to be a minority in this part of the world. They are the majority. Over the uh, course of the 20th century, the minorities in the Islamic world have eroded. Um, some of them are extinct. Some of them will be soon. First, it was the Jews, um, one million of whom lived in Islamic countries in the 40s. Baghdad, for example, by some uh, counts, was a third Jewish in the 40s. Um, those people are gone. Most of them came here. The Christian population has been eroding across the Middle East. And there has also been an erosion of lesser known groups like the Mandeans and the Zoroastrians. And now, of course, the, the Yazidis, um, who no one had heard of before, but um, are famous now because their extinction has been so spectacular and horrific. Now, all of the minorities in this region are facing the same thing, which is the rise of an aggressive and intolerant strain of Islam among the majority. So those who are defenseless are losing and probably won't survive. Uh, those who can defend themselves have a shot at survival, the Kurds, for example, and the Jews. So this has led us to a situation which people like my grandfather or people of my grandfather's generation would have found impossible to believe, which is that we have Christians uh, seeking protection from a Jewish army. Um, what is um, emerging is a kind of strange and uncomfortable alliance of minorities. Israel was founded to protect Jews, obviously. 
But the events of recent years offer an opportunity to extend that protection to others. Just as, for example, the Baha'i sect, which is persecuted in Iran, has its most important shrine and its world headquarters in Haifa. Um, this, isn't, this isn't just a Jewish refuge anymore. It is, in fact, the last secure minority refuge in this region. And that, I think, comes with responsibilities. And it also presents a chance for multiculturalism, which I think we need to seize. A lot of, um, a lot of people I think would like to see us see this as a simple story uh, of Jews becoming a majority. Um, of course, Jews have always been a minority, and the founding of this state changed that in some ways, but not others. And I think it's important to understand the ways in which Zionism revolutionized the Jewish situation on Earth, and the ways in which it did not. And Zionism was supposed to um, end anti-Semitism, for example. Zionism was supposed to change the state of the Jew on, on Earth. And I think it should be apparent to everyone now, this year, last year, these days, that that has not happened. And um, that our situation is very different in some ways and not at all different in others. And when we talk about the minorities in Israel, I think it's very important to remember that the biggest minority in Israel is us. Um, we are a minority uh, faced uh, with a threat from a majority culture. So not, not everything has changed. And what we see right now is that our fate is bound up with the fate of other minorities in this region. Um, and what has changed is that um, we have a chance for the first time not only to protect ourselves, but to help others whose distress should be uh, familiar to us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mati. Um, I'm told that uh, without the hand mic, I'm uh, still uh, somebody who everybody can hear us. So uh, we're going to use this hand mic for questions from the audience. I'm going to take the, uh, the, uh, the first two questions from our online viewers, one that was actually written to us even before the seminar, and it turns some of the uh, complexities of this uh, conversation on its head. I'm going to address it to you, Ilana. This is from Clara Silver, who didn't tell us where she's from, but she says, and, and this is, she, of course she asked more than one question, we'll, we'll stick to only one of them, um, but it dovetails exactly with, a, with what Mati ended with and what you began with, and it says that, even though Jews are numerically a cultural and religious minority across the globe, many American Jews don't have a minority identity and push back against American Jewish organizations that operate with that view. So I want to leave that statement, first of all, in the, put that statement into the form of a question. Do, in fact, American Jews not have a minority identity, and do they, in fact, push back against American Jewish organizations that operate that view, and what are the implications of that? You're directing to me. I, I, I sure hear am. the entire question. As I understand it, what you're asking is about the minority identity of North American Jews or specifically American Jews. And um, it appears to me that you have real divisions on this issue. I think this breaks down uh, based on sometimes political affiliations, sometimes religious affiliations, whether Jews actually feel like a minority um, in the United States. I will say I think that most Jews feel very at home in the United States, even if they have somewhat of a minority sensibility. Um, what I am noticing is certainly among a uh, younger generation, the desire to be viewed as a minority as opposed to as a boutique group of people, um, that's the desire not to be viewed as a minority yeah, certainly is uh, a strong impulse. But that's really just, I, I think that's really just because of the melting pot nature and the um, dual try quad identities that um, people carry around today. That's kind of my impression. And I actually think that what we saw play out uh, specifically with specifically with members of Congress, Jewish members of Congress who were making public proclamations as to whether they would uh, attend Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech in Congress, I definitely think that that question of being a minority or not being a minority or trying to assert oneself as being part of the majority, that, that was definitely playing out there. Um, and I think it's sort of indicative of how, it was so surprising in certain ways and so uncomfortable for the North American Jewish community that this conversation is being had in any, rate, in any way that I, I think it indicates the degree to which we try to suppress uh, that minority identity basically across the board, if that's somewhat clear. 
Thanks, thanks, Ilana. I'm, I'm going to take one more online question and then we'll open up to questions here. Uh, remember, uh, keep your question in the form of a question and we wait until we get the microphone, the hand mic to you. So this is one I'm going to address to uh, Mati because again, it uh, dovetails with uh, the closing of his comment and it's from Steve Denker who also, unfortunately, I wish he could have told us where he's from, but says, does not creating and maintaining the space in the middle require that the majority rulers make space for the minority and help them to feel that they have a stake in the polity, the uh, public, uh, the community of the, you know, the public space in their country. Mati, this one's for you. Uh, oh, thank you. Should I? Uh, thank you for the, for the question. Um, my, I would say, of course, um, and I think Israel has um, been expert at missing every possible opportunity to create that space for the Arab minority. Um, the, the polling numbers, which were mentioned in the previous session, are striking. Um, when the Arab uh, sector is polled here, um, I was looking at a poll, which I believe was two years old already, um, but I imagine the numbers haven't changed too much. 79% um, of Arab Israelis said they were happy with their lives in Israel, which is an astonishing number. I don't remember what the number was for Israeli Jews, but I'm guessing it was lower. Um, uh, so, you know, there are opportunities that, that we've missed, and um, judging by, you know, uh, current policies and the polling numbers leading up to the next election, I imagine we'll continue to miss them. Um, although it is worth pointing out, just playing kind of de devil's advocate um, here, that the situation um, of Israel vis a vis its um, minority, which is an Arab Muslim minority, is entirely different from other parallel situations which people imagine. When looking at this country from abroad, it's different from the Jews of Persia 2,500 years ago, or whenever it was that Purim story happened. Um, it's different from the situation of African Americans. Um, the uh, minority in this country is part of a majority culture that threatens this country and has for 100 years. Um, the Jews of Israel, uh, are now around 6 million people, have been facing um, and have been outnumbered by members of the same group that constitute the, lar the large minority inside Israel. So that is a complicated situation. And it's not um, as simple as the African-American call in the 60s, which we're hearing a lot about now with the Selma anniversary for integration and equality. That is not exactly what um, Israel's Arab minority is asking for. And the situation here is, is different in, in important ways that I think should kind of give pause before we draw too easy uh, parallels between um, the Israel and its Arab minority and, for example, America and its Jewish minority or Persia and its uh, Jewish minority or any other situation. Um, th there are very few sim situations that are similar to this one. Thanks, Amati. By the way, Clara is clearly watching the program because she commented on our chat site that she's from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and put three exclamation points after that. So she wanted to know where she's, where she's from. That's the only way to make Ann Arbor sound exciting. <laughs> wow. All right, we have a question here from the uh, audience here in Jerusalem. Please uh, put the mic right up to your face, and uh, we're going to actually uh, want to hear you uh, tell us who you are and, and your question, and also to whom the question is directed. Thank you. Okay, hi. I have another way to make uh, Ann Arbor sound exciting. I'm from Marquette, Michigan. My name's Gabriel <laughs> Brahm, and I teach English at Northern Michigan University, which is to the north of Ann Arbor, um, and much smaller. Uh, I want to thank Maddie Friedman for a marvelous uh, talk. Um, my question is for you. I was at a conference recently where Sari Makdisi, a professor of English at uh, UCLA, a pretty well-known guy, happens to be the nephew of Edward Said, uh, was speaking, and he advocated uh, one, uh, one state from the river to the, the sea um, that would be, he said, neither an, a Jewish state, which is abhorrent because it's ethno-nationalist, nor, nor an Arab state. But, but by the way, with the so-called right of return, Arabs would be a majority. So I asked him, why then wouldn't it be an Arab state? And he said, well, it would be secular. And I said, well, but come on. And, and, and then he said, pardon my French, I'm quoting him, that's racist bullshit. Uh, just the very concern to even ask about what it would mean for Jews and Christians to be a minority in, in an Arab state. Uh, how would you have uh, answered uh, that uh, um, accusation from, from him? I think that there's, there are really two Israels. So there's 
real Israel, which is a very complicated little place, um, which like any foreign country, um, in order to understand it, you have to be here for a long time and speak the language and kind of breathe it. And then there's fantasy Israel, which is, I think, where uh, Makdisi probably, um, uh, you know, sunbathes and uh, drinks cappuccino. Um, no one here sees that as a real option, Jews or Arabs, um, because it's it would never it would never work. I mean, what would an army of of that state look? What um, what would bind you know the, the citizens of that state uh, together? Um, I think what lies behind that um, fantasy, because that's what it is, is an attempt to destroy Israel and make it sound nice, basically. Um, they're having a lot of success, by the way. Um, and it kind of makes sense in, a, in the theoretical kind of fantasy world in which these guys operate. On the ground, it's impossible, obviously, which is why there's no constituency for that idea here. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Gershom Gorenberg, for example, is a really smart guy, definitely from the left, has written about it uh, from the left as an impractical solution. So, I mean, if you could point to a state in the Middle East, a multicultural state in the Middle East that is functional and safe, I might, you know, engage you in a discussion um, because no such state exists. And unfortunately, um, minorities here will live by their sword in the foreseeable future or will not live here. Um, then this is just kind of... Um, yeah, it's just empty talk, kalam fadi, in Arabic. Yeah. Thanks, Mati. We have another question here from the audience here in Jerusalem. Please hold the mic to your face and tell us who you are and your question, please. My name is Ben. I'm a recent graduate of international relations from St. Andrews University. I'm visiting here from Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, my question is to Matty. Um, you mentioned beforehand you used the kind of collective term of Israeli Jews um, and particularly how Christian Arabs feel associated with them. Um, I wanted to ask whether or not through your research you think if there was greater um, representation among particularly minorities among Israeli Jews, namely Sephardi Jews who have originated from Arab states, whether or not you think there might be among particularly Christian Arabs whether they would feel more aligned to, to the state of Israel, and, and in the case of what you were saying before, per, uh, perhaps going into the, the draft. That, that's an interesting question. Um, whether there would be a kind of easier common ground if, if the um, Mizrahi side of Israel were brought more to the fore is a very interesting question. Um, I've written about that a bit. I wrote an essay last spring called Mizrahi Nation, which is about how, how understanding Israel now requires us to understand that the Mizrahi side of Israel, which is what you're referring to, is not a footnote, but is actually probably the most important story to understand about Israel in this century, because this century, in this century, Israel's story is a story about the Middle East, and half of the Jewish population here is Middle Eastern. Um, whether it, that would make it easier or, or harder, I'm not sure. Um, in, in the Middle East, um, Things are round, things tend to be round in a way that Europeans tend to see straight lines and and squares. So my gut re response to your question is yes. If there was a more kind of flexible Middle Eastern attitude toward um, this toward our neighbors, more things would become possible. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to say. I think that both things are happening. I think that there um, we're seeing it. There's more movement on the part of. Christian Arabs toward Israel and Israel's Middle Eastern character is coming to the fore um, more and more in everyday culture and the way the country is in people's uh, take on religion. It's becoming very Mizrahi and people's take on politics. It's becoming very Mizrahi. Um, where that will lead, I'm not sure, but I hope that the results will be positive. Thanks a lot. Um, Elana, I know you're going to have to leave us in a few minutes, so I will take the moderator's uh, prerogative to ask you a question uh, so you don't get off uh, easy, as it were. And in light of the complexities, and I saw you scribbling notes uh, during Mati's uh, talk, it seems that you have some things you wanted to say, you wanted to add or come. Uh, or contribute to this. And again, in the context of how complex this all is, is there a way out where different minorities can, in fact, find a way to work together in a multinational, multicultural country um, be involving different shades of Jews, different shades of Arabs and Muslims, and the different religions? Is, the, is this too complex not to untie? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Monty's point about the Jews being a minority in the region is an essential point. And I think it's very important to recognize that there's no simple uh, comparison or parallel to be made. At the same time, I'm very inspired by Monty's presentation in the sense that when I think about uh, sort of each and every example of the Jews as minority um, in a country, literally throughout Jewish history, starting with these Esther or Exodus texts, the significant figures become the people who see themselves as holding both identities. You know, the Moses figure, the Esther figure. And I think that what Mati is really talking about is he's really talking about those people who can straddle the fence. And what I'm suggesting is that there are people who straddle the fence in lots of different ways. And it's very important to recognize those different ways in which there are people who can be connectors and can be transition figures and figures who can kind of bridge um, in, in one sense or another. And that's something that isn't necessarily so doable or, or noticeable at the, you know, what I was at an American would say the federal level or the government level, but certainly in a uh, local, whether it's local government or in various sectors, whether it's NGOs or professional sectors, there are ways in which those bridge figures, you know, should be embraced or the hand should be shook and people should be looking for them and they should be looking for others. And I think what Mati is describing is one version of that. Um, I think there are a few different versions of that, but I think what Mati is describing is one version of that. And I think that's very important. Thanks, Ilana. If uh, you have to, uh, I know you have to leave. We only have a few minutes as well to the entire program. So uh, just in case we don't get to say goodbye, I want to thank you for your uh, participation. I'm sure it's going to be the first of many uh, with us here, both uh, on a video uh, setup and, of course, when you're here with us, I expect this coming summer with the Hartman Institute. You look like you have one more thing you want to say. I'll let you I say it. You're so good at reading my body language. Alan, amazing. Thank you. There is one thing. I know that I think it was David, who's a professor at Michigan, um, who, who addressed this question to Mati. There just is one thing, uh, uh, thing uh, that is an Emmanuel Levinas perspective that I, I think is incredibly significant. The way he frames uh, the state of Israel is that it is a political entity with an ethical imperative, and that ethical imperative is to protect Jewish lives. Um, and if history is any indicator of the future, history would demand that, call it racist or don't call it racist, that ethical imperative is something that stands. And I, I, I think that that's actually an important response to, um, you know, very modern uh, or postmodern attacks on particular groups who want to assert their identity as something unique and significant and worth protecting. So that's my, my final word. Thanks very much, Ilana. Um, we are going to have another question here from the audience here in Jerusalem. Mike is yours. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Aaron Kerman. I'm a lawyer and a student of conflict resolution. I was curious about the subsection of the Christian community, Christian Arab community here in Israel that you spoke about, who sees their lot more with Jewish Israelis than with uh, Muslim Palestinians. And I was curious in particular about their views of the occupation of the prospect of a Palestinian state and the peace process to the extent that there still is one. I wouldn't. Yeah, that's a great question. By the way, I don't. Um, I don't know enough about the subject to speak in their name about it. Um, and if you're interested, you can you can find them. They're pretty easy to find. In Jish, there's a center for uh, for the study of Aramaic. Um, and I would actually be really interested interested to hear what what they have to say about it. My sense is, and again, I, this is just me analyzing it from from afar, having not done you know enough research. Um, what is driving people right now in the Middle East is a sense of immediate fear. Everyone in this region is freaking out right now, and rightly so. Um, so more theoretical questions, like even, even like the occupation, which is, of course, a huge question, um, these have kind of receded in the face of kind of the, the horrific nature of the onslaught that many people across this region are facing. So it's my sense that while the occupation is probably not something that you know these people are fans of, as I'm not and as many Israelis are not, um, they might be saying to themselves, oh, as many Israelis do, I will go to the army to protect my life and the lives of my family, 
recognizing that there are parts of Israeli policy with which I disagree very strongly. So, you know, people are, have a complicated take on it and they can weigh different things. And, and I imagine that's what they're doing, but that's just me, me talking. And if you contact anyone there and hear something interesting about it, I'd love to, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we'll be uh, Anglo, as it were, and try and finish on time. So we're going to have one last question, and we'll have a few uh, closing comments. Please. Hi, um, I'm Tao uh, from London. I was thinking about some of the things you were saying about minorities, and I was wondering how many compromises the concept of like Zionism needs to take to make space for minorities in Israel. Um, expand on that a bit. What, what exactly do you mean? Um, I've been thinking about how, like, if well, we do have minorities in Israel, particularly the Christian minority that you spoke about, and the Arab minority, even though they are a majority in this area, and if we are going to make any space for them in Israeli society, there's some kind of concepts of Zionism, I think, that may need to be, like, have less of a impact, perhaps, or less strength put on them, and I was wondering how far you think that needs to be taken. That's, I mean, that's a huge question for Israel. So in the Declaration of Independence, it's pretty clear we, this is a Jewish state, and part of being a Jewish state is granting equal rights to everyone who's here, uh, irrespective of religion or gender, or et cetera, et cetera. And of course, that is the kind of situation we strive for and have not managed to, to achieve. Um, again, kind of, I don't want to seem to, uh, to be an apologist, um, but you know, this has all been playing out in very... Uh, unique and trying circumstances, both for the Jewish majority in Israel and for the Arab minority in Israel, being representative of two groups that are that have been basically at each other's throats for hundred for a hundred years. So yes, I think that Zionism. I think part certainly for me, part, Zionism um, requires um, compassion for people who find themselves in a situation similar to the situ to our own situation for two thousand years or whatever it was. Um, and I think that we're not we're not there. Um, so I think that we we need to do more, and I think that particularly in the current um, context of the Middle East, there are opportunities here to create that space. So on, on the one hand, the situation in the Middle East is horrific. There's never going to be peace here. There will be no peace agreement. Um, the ideas of the 90s are dead, and what we have to expect here in the future in this region is quite grim. Um, although I'm optimistic about the future of the country, we have to steel ourselves for um, um, rough seas ahead. But in a contradictory way, that that actually presents an opportunity, because I think that um, when members of Israel's minorities look around, um, Israel might seem like not such a bad place after all. So Israel's flaws are many, um, of course, certainly vis-a-vis -vis the, the minorities. But the other options, which might have seemed possible 15 years ago, haven't panned out, and in fact, most people here, I think, re realize that they're dead, and that um, presents an opportunity for Israel to embrace the Arab minority now, not just the Christians, who, some of whom are are begging essentially for us to embrace them, but even um, the Arab Muslim minority, which has necessarily, and I've, I understand them completely, an ambivalent relationship toward Israel. I think now would be a great time for an initiative to bring them closer, um, because we are offering something that no one else in this region can offer, which is a safe, liberal space, uh, as flawed as it may be. Thanks very much. I think we're going to end the program now. Um, for uh, us also to answer one of the online questions, the a video of this program will be available on our website, uh, hopefully soon, and certainly tune in uh, and check in with us at hartman.org.il. And again, I apologize for a little commercialism here. Um, and again, one last thing, reminder that in, a, in eight days on election day here in Israel, live as the polls close, there's going to be news and commentary from Daniil Hartman, Yossi klein -Alevi, um, to tell, uh, to talk about what the elections mean. And in fact, because we've run out of time, Mati, I won't put you on the spot making pre-election predictions, um, but maybe you'll write them down for me. You'll write them down for me and we'll open them up on election night and see how well you did. I want again, I want to thank everybody both here in Jerusalem. We had a, a nice full room and everybody who watched online. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, stay tuned to the Hartman Institute for more programs and if there are any coming to your communities in the United States. I want to thank you again and good night from Jerusalem.